this is my new office. And um, <clears throat> if you see the paper and all on the on the deck back there, it's tax time. So that's sorting out files to send off to the tax accountant. Uh, and I don't have anything on the walls just yet because most of that is still at my office at the Naval War College, which has been locked solid shut since the 25th of March last year. So uh, one of these days I'll be able to get back in it and complete the, the decor here, if you will. Well, this is the third uh, lecture in a four-part lecture series on the War of American Independence. And tonight, as you can see from the title, I'm going to basically take 1776, uh, starting more or less with the, uh, the British resurgence, if you will, coming back to the New York campaign in the summer of 1776 and take it up through uh, where the, uh, the British Army evacuated Philadelphia and moved back to uh, New York City. The fourth part, uh, which is, I think, the 24th, we decided, next Wednesday, the 24th, and I'll talk about the Southern Campaign and also the, uh, the War at Sea, the Naval War. So let me start with this. You're going to see you're going to see this slide a couple of times. And the reason I like this slide is because if you think about what British strategists were doing, uh, you see a not a drift so much as, as a change in the overall strategic uh, thrust uh, as one went into the other and didn't work. Well, last time, the last two times, we've basically been in the great riot phase. And the idea there was just simply use brute military force to suppress the rebellion uh, and prevent foreign interference and to basically undercut uh, what was seen as a small group of stroppy revolutionaries in New England. Well, it became pretty obvious that it was a much greater uh, revolt than just simply in Massachusetts. Uh, and that clearly uh, that was not going to work in the phase one, just suppressed by brute force. So then we move into what I call phase two, the divide and conquer phase. And the idea here is where you want to isolate the New England colonies from the middle colonies and the southern colonies, where it was felt there was a lot more um, uh, support for the crown, much more uh, higher number of loyalists. Um, and also go after uh, what we're seen as the rebel centers of gravity. Now, that's a great term that we use in the military strategic thinking. Center of gravity is just basically if you destroy that or capture it or eliminate or uh, cancel it out, then the, the other side collapses. And in the 18th century, it was considered typically a city, a capital, uh, or in this case, uh, the enemy main army, the Continental Army. So that's going to be uh, essentially the, the thrust here of tonight, the divide and conquer attempts uh, to isolate New England, and that's going to result in Saratoga, and also to destroy the rebel centers of gravity, the capital of Philadelphia and the Continental Army. So next week, we'll go on to the <clears throat> phase three, the loyalist strategy. So British forces on the offensive. And this is going to lead to a massive invasion of uh, New York, uh, Long Island and, the, and Manhattan in the summer of 1776. It was the largest British expeditionary force ever mounted to that day. And I suspect, although I'm not positive, it's, it was the largest British expeditionary force up until you had World War I with the injection of the uh, uh, British expeditionary expeditionary force into northern France and Belgium. So it was a huge deal. And it was launched from Nova Scotia. You remember I said last time that um, General Howe evacuated Boston in, in uh, March of 1776. They all went up to Halifax uh, uh, in Nova Scotia. And that is where the reinforcements came in. Uh, by the way, that's when Lord Cornwallis, who you're going to hear a lot of tonight and next week, uh, arrived with several regiments uh, from Cork, Ireland. And so you build this massive army and naval force uh, in Nova Scotia and then move them down to the New York City area to launch this campaign. Now, General Howe, Lieutenant General uh, William Howe, he was going to be knighted uh, after uh, this campaign. Uh, he was of a very noble family. They were related to the, to the royal family, actually. Uh, and his brother, Vice Admiral uh, William Howe, Lord Howe, uh, 
uh, was the naval commander. So you have two brothers cooperating here, one the land commander, one the naval commander for the uh, bulk of this period. They worked very well together. Here's the thing about the Howe brothers. They were political Whigs, and the Whigs essentially were the party that opposed uh, the crown. Uh, they were made up of major landowners, nobility, and a lot of what we would call the middle class or the merchant class, uh, as opposed to the Tory uh, party, which was the party of the ministry, uh, and they supported the, the, uh, the monarchy. So essentially, the Howe brothers felt that, all right, we, we thrashed the Continental Army. We don't destroy it, but we've proved them that they can't win. And then let's all sit down and come to terms and negotiate the end of this, uh, of this rebellion. That's going to impact a lot of what Howe does operationally in the field, as you're going to see. Well, there, of course, is uh, George Washington and his plan for defending New York, because he always felt that that was going to be the target. Once the British forces evacuated Boston, Washington was pretty confident that the next target would, in fact, be New York City. So in that interim between their evacuation and the time that they arrived in the summer of 76, he constructed several fortified posts along uh, Long Island and Manhattan and along uh, the New Jersey coast there. For example, Fort Washington was a defended post in Manhattan and Fort Lee was on the New Jersey side. Uh, he split his forces between Manhattan and Long Island. Uh, he believed that the major thrust was gonna come against Manhattan, uh, but he also was worried about the British outflanking Manhattan by coming across Long Island, which in fact is, is exactly what happened. So let me uh, talk a little bit about the nature of, of the Continental Line by this point. Now, if this were a live class, I would ask the question, how many of you in the audience think this is what the Continental Army actually looked like? And there might be one or two very tentative hands. Um, this is a, obviously an idealized portrait uh, or painting rather. Very, very few regiments um, actually had the full uniforms. Uh, a lot of times the colonels of the regiment, uh, if they had a lot of money, might throw in a bit and get some better uniforms. But typically, uh, the Continental Line regiments, it was come as you are. Uh, so you'd see all sorts of mixture of hunting shirts or hunting frocks, civilian type clothes. Uh, as the war went on, uh, a lot of it depended on how good their individual states, because these were all state regiments uh, serving in the Continental Line, uh, how much willing uh, they were to uh, to toss in money to be able to outfit their, their uh, units in standardized clothing. And I think I mentioned this earlier, uh, but if not, one of the things that distinguishes 18th century military uniforms is because in combat with the smoke from the black powder, uh, the chaos, the noise, you needed to be able to identify uh, your fellow members of your regiment. And the way they would do this is with very distinctive buttons or patterns of buttons, or in this case, um, they were distinguished by the color of their facings here, uh, cuffs and collars. And uh, white, um, uh, as I recall, would be uh, New England. Um, uh, light blue would be a Southern regiment. That's probably what that's depicting there. Uh, buff, I don't, oh, there's one back there, buff color. Those would be middle colony. So, um, the idea is that you can identify your fellow members of your unit by such things as a uh, uniform uh, and flags as well. So that's an idealized picture of the Continental Line. Some units would have been that well uh, accoutred and uh, uniformed, but uh, actually very few. And there, of course, is again, a very highly stylized, idealized uh, uh, picture of the Continental Line. Now, what had happened in that interim, uh, that four or five months interim, is a lot of Continental uh, regiments had gathered for the defense of New York, and they literally came from all over uh, the, uh, the colonies at this time. And the Continental Army uh, basically unified into a national army. Uh, and that, that's the way to think about them. Yes, they are made up of individual states' regiments. For example, the 2nd the Rhode Island or the 4th uh, the New York 
infantry or uh, the, the six North Carolina of the Continental Line. They were from their states and they were controlled by their state governments, but they basically merged into this Continental Army uh, or a national army. So now you have Washington having established a major defensive line along the Brooklyn Heights, uh, along Long Island. And of course, if you go to the battlefield now, it's, it's under Brooklyn. Uh, but at that time, it was essentially pasture and farmland. Uh, the problem here, and this was pretty typical of 18th century forces, uh, some worse than others, uh, discipline uh, in the ranks, lack of training, uh, this really showed. They, they were just not very effective military weapons this early in the war. Camp hygiene was particularly bad, uh, even among the more disciplined troops. For example, uh, the British force that surrendered at Yorktown in 1781, uh, of the five to 6,000 troops that were uh, in Yorktown at the time of the surrender, only about half of them were actually capable of marching out to surrender field. Uh, they were down with uh, various maladies dysentery was particularly bad. Uh, and so you can imagine with a well-trained, well-disciplined professional force like that, you can imagine how bad the hygiene and the illness and the disease was uh, among the Continental Army troops. Uh, now, one other problem that George Washington is going to constantly face is the enlistments tended to be very short term, uh, maybe a year or so. And they typically uh, would expire on the 31st of December. So come every December, uh, he had to dance through a lot of hoops just to maintain the, uh, the number of troops that he had. Uh, a lot of these folks, they would have done their time and they're headed back home. So let's talk about the New York campaign here. Campaign of 1776. So on the 2nd of July, uh, British forces coming down uh, by troop ship uh, landed on Staten Island, and this began the buildup, the gradual buildup, to 32,000 uh, British troops uh, within six weeks, uh, supported by 400 ships. So when I say it was the largest British uh, amphibious operation to, to date and really up until the uh, First World War, uh, I'm not joking there. Uh, the Royal Navy, of course, uh, cut off all seaward communications um, through their 73 warships. The rest were transports and supply ships. Uh, they actually ran up the Hudson, up and down the Hudson, and controlled the waterways and cut off communications uh, out of New York with the rest of the colonies. Now, how did Washington respond? Well, as I mentioned earlier, uh, he put most of his troops on Manhattan Island, uh, which at that time, uh, I'll show you uh, some maps, but the, the city of New York really only went up as far as, I think, maybe 23rd, 24th Street. So if you know the city of New York, you know that's basically that down, downtown district. Um, but that's where Washington expected uh, the uh, attack. Now, because the Howes were also commissioners for the peace, charged with negotiating an end to the rebellion, they actually met with some emissaries from the Continental Congress and I believe that included uh, Ben Franklin, and uh, I, I'm having a mental moment here, but there were three prominent members that actually went to negotiate uh, with the Howe brothers uh, and came away with nothing. Uh, they, they simply weren't going to accept anything less than complete political independence by this time. Because remember now, you are in the post-Declaration of Independence period after the 2nd of July. All righty. Well, here is... Uh, a period map. Uh, so here is the Brooklyn Heights along in here. Again, that's the uh, modern day area of Queens and Brooklyn. There's Manhattan, but the actual city only went up to probably about there. Uh, the rest of it was farmland, and pasture land and whatever. But that is a period map and actually a fairly accurate one considering all. So the British forces land they make an initial assault up the Guana Heights, which again right now is uh, is under the, uh, the borough of Brooklyn. Uh, and Lord Howe uh, decided to try to outflank uh, the Continental Line, the defenses. And this was a very common uh, tactical move in the period and, and is still today. If you think about the Gulf War of 30 years ago, that was a flanking maneuver. You get around the opponent's side and into his rear, 
Well, that's exactly what Lloyd, Lord uh, Howe did. Uh, sorry, Sir, uh, Sir William Howe. Um, and he swung around to the continental left at the Jamaica Pass and encountered only five militia mounted officers. Uh, unfortunately, the Continentals had uh, not fortified or defended that area. And so by this uh, surprise night march, uh, the British came literally up on the left flank of the uh, of the Continental forces. Um, and then, of course, the main assault started uh, directly in front. And that's really all it took for the uh, Continental initial uh, defenses that were out front to pretty much collapse. Here's another period map. Um, and actually, you see uh, troop movements here, here's Staten Island. Uh, the British forces landed at various points uh, along the, uh, the coast here and moved in to uh, the Brooklyn Heights line, which is up in here. Uh, Jamaica Pass uh, would be somewhere around here, somewhere around here. Um, so that's essentially the area we're talking about, the battlefield area. Well, so Howe had outflanked the Continental Line, which crumbled. Uh, discipline collapsed. There was rout and panic. Uh, and really, the only thing that saved the, uh, the Continental uh, Line was um, a uh, regiment of, of uh, Maryland infantry, uh, actually Smallwoods Regiment. Uh, and if you're ever in the D.C. area and if we ever get out of this damn plague and you can travel again, if you want to go... Uh, to uh, Colonel Smallwood's plantation. It's a very nicely preserved park and historic house. Uh, but Smallwood's regiment of the Maryland line stood fast. And because they stood fast and slowed down the British advance, it allowed most of the troops to actually flee uh, back to the second line of defenses, which was the Brooklyn uh, defensive line along the Brooklyn Heights. And so uh, at this point, uh, they're defending the Brooklyn Heights, which actually was more fortified. Uh, there was a series of forts uh, across the Brooklyn Heights and actually mounted 36 field guns. So this was going to be a little tougher nut to crack. Uh, nonetheless, on the 29th of August, Sir William Howe attacks and the, uh, uh, the attack carries the, uh, the Brooklyn Heights. So based on this, uh, as quickly and safely as possible, uh, George Washington evacuated his troops from Long Island. Uh, as I recall the story, they, of course, they were evacuating by boat. They were able to do this because a fog set in and they were able to escape in the fog back to Manhattan. Well, Lord Howe then came across chasing. I believe they actually landed about with 33rd Street. Um, comes a, across the uh, Manhattan Peninsula there. And um, pretty much at this point, uh, Manhattan was, uh, was compromised and Washington was forced to evacuate again across to New Jersey and north towards uh, White Plains. And that's going to precipitate yet another engagement here, the Battle of White Plains, uh, but also the battles of Fort Washington and Fort Lee. So basically, uh, Washington and the Continental Army are being driven out of one defensive position after another. And by the early autumn, they're basically in full retreat uh, down New Jersey towards the Delaware River. Uh, and in that autumn of 1776, what you see is the British forces just completely overrunning uh, New Jersey and chasing Continental Army and, uh, and uh, Washington's command all the way to the Delaware River into Pennsylvania, uh, across the river into Pennsylvania by December of 1776. So British arms are victorious. And one of the things about uh, pre-modern warfare is it was very difficult to actually conduct uh, warfare in the winter time for pretty obvious reasons. Uh, you're out, uh, out in the elements. Uh, you may or may not have tendage. Uh, certainly, food and forage is a real problem. Uh, so, typically, 18th century armies would go into winter quarters, and that was typically from say November on to maybe March or April. And it was during the winter quarters they would repair uniforms, repair their gear, reinforcements would arrive, training would occur, these sorts of things, but very few active military operations. Uh, 
And so given that, uh, in by December of 1776, the British Army has gone into winter quarters at a whole series of posts around uh, New Jersey. And one of the most important ones is at the little town of Trenton, which is, I guess, now the capital of, of uh, New Jersey. A brigade of the German auxiliary troops, and in fact, if you look very carefully in this picture, uh, you can see those are uh, the German auxiliaries, most of which had come from Hesse Kassel. I call them auxiliaries because what typically happened with uh, armies in the 18th century, they were very expensive. And so monarchs, uh, when they needed troops, typically they would hire troops. Uh, and one of the best recruiting grounds for hiring entire regiments, not just individual mercenaries, we're not going to call the mercenaries, but you would go in and hire a complete unit, a complete regiment. And the uh, princes throughout the Holy Roman Empire, the Germanic states, were more than happy to hire out their regiments because this was the only way they could afford to actually keep them in being. Uh, and so uh, they're known as Hessians simply because most of them actually came from the Principality of Hesse-Cassel. But they were also from Brunswick, from uh, um, Anspach, uh, basically uh, south and western Germany. Many, many uh, German troops actually uh, were hired for this war. And in fact, the British crown tried to hire Russian regiments, but the, uh, uh, the Tsar was not very interested. So the little town of Trenton. Uh, a brigade of these Hessian auxiliaries were there, and that event that I'm going to deal with here in a moment uh, turned out to be perhaps the event that saved the American Revolution uh, for the Patriot side, and that is the events at Trenton and Princeton. But before I get there, uh, I just want to highlight the fact that Howe had established essentially the main operating base uh, for the rest of the war, literally, at New York. Uh, there was some negative to New York as a main operating base, and that has to do with Sandy Hook, which if you uh, know the geography there, Sandy Hook is basically a large sandbar that comes out northern New Jersey uh, and into the approaches to New York Harbor. Uh, you had to be able to get over the bar, uh, which is a, a sand berm that's underwater. At high tide, you could sail over it. If it was low tide or the water level was low, typically these heavy warships could not get over the bar. And uh, that became a, a real concern at various times. And you're going to see how that plays out as a huge factor uh, in the Yorktown campaign. And that is the inability of the British Royal Navy ships to get over that bar uh, early enough to uh, reinforce Lord Cornwallis. Well, before I go into Trenton, I want to mention this, the Loyalist response. There were a great number of Loyalist forces that were raised in the uh, northern and middle colonies, and particularly after the success of the 1776 campaign. Uh, here you see South Carolina Loyalist uh, Regiment. It looks like a Dragoon Regiment, you can tell, because they typically would wear green uniforms. And you see the South Carolina Palmetto or, or, or Half Moon device on their hats. But there were a number that were raised in the New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania area uh, in this 1776-77 time frame. Uh, for example, uh, Delancey's Brigade, uh, over a thousand men, Loyalists uh, raised largely in the New York area. Uh, one that's going to play large in the Southern Campaign is the British Legion, uh, New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. But there were troops raised elsewhere in the South, for example, the South Carolina Loyalist uh, Regiment had over a thousand men. Uh, it's estimated by um, a really fine historian by the name of Paul Smith that throughout the war, uh, some 19 to 25,000 loyalists actually served in these provincial uh, regiments. All right, moving on. The gamble at Trenton. Uh, the night of 25 to 26 December 1776. Uh, Washington needed a huge incremental victory. His enlistments were expiring in a few days. Uh, the army was depleted. Uh, he had had uh, 19,000 troops when the uh, New York campaign started. But by late December, as the army lay across the Delaware River in Pennsylvania, uh, they were down to 3,000 or so. And most of those enlistments were about to expire. 
So he needed something, a desperate gamble, to prove that the Continental Army was still viable, that the uh, rebellion or revolution was still viable, and that the British forces could actually be beaten. And that's going to be Trenton. Uh, now, one of the factors that really aggravated the, the British uh, attempts to pacify and restore New Jersey and New York to allegiance was the fact that the German troops had a really bad reputation. And you can imagine what kind of reputation that was. Well, all they were doing was what was done throughout continental Europe. Just when an army came through, didn't matter who it was, you could expect a lot of rape, pillage, burn, looting. It just was what was done. Um, and so they did that in New Jersey. And you can imagine the, the outcry, the hue and cry. W what that did was it stirred up the residents. And by late in the fall of 1776, you see a huge uh, militia turnout uh, in New Jersey, especially. And these folks um, are going to uh, play a seminal part in what is upcoming at the Trenton and Princeton battles. Well, so 14 December. Uh, three regiments uh, of uh, Hessian troops occupy Trenton, roughly about 1,400 men. Uh, all through this period leading up to the, uh, the Trenton affair, uh, there were attacks on the outposts, uh, particularly um, by uh, the New Jersey militia, sort of hit and run raids, if you will. And so the troops were on very high alert. And in fact, here's a testimony of one of the German officers who wrote, Quote, we have not slept one night in peace since we came to this place, end quote. One of the great myths of this whole period is that uh, by attacking on Christmas that the Hessians were unprepared and they were drunk and what absolutely false. Because of the high alert status and because of the raids and attacks of the militia, uh, the soldiers slept in shifts in uniform, fully kitted out and ready for action. Uh, but you can imagine the tension uh, that these guys were under. Uh, they were commanded by Colonel Johann Rahl, who was a professional soldier. Uh, he requested uh, re reinforcements uh, to deal with these raids on his outpost, um, and he was convinced that a major attack was coming. So to say that his troops were ill-prepared or not prepared, uh, uh, it just simply that's one of the great myths of this period. They were they looked like this at all times um, <clears throat> other than when they were sleeping or eating or whatever. And uh, they were doing guard duty or pickets uh, when not. But the problem was <clears throat> the weather. Remember, this is late December and weather is pretty foul. And one of the problems that the Hessians had was they didn't have forward pickets or outposts because of the weather. So re it really was a pretty much a surprise when the attack actually came. And of course, no one expected um, the uh, Continentals to cross the river, which was choked with ice flows. This is a really dramatic painting by uh, the German artist Emanuel Lutze. Uh, it hangs in the uh, uh, New York Metropolitan Museum of Art and for those of you who've seen it, you might have been surprised at how big it is. It is huge and takes up the entire wall. Uh, but it is really pretty dramatic and captures the, that sort of spirit of 76 uh, imagery. And, of course, you see the heroic image of Washington with the, the flag and all. So it's, it might be the most famous painting uh, depicting the war. Well, of course, Lutze painted in the 1850s and had really no idea what it really looked like. Uh, nonetheless, it captures the, the, the heroic imagery uh, uh, of, the, of the battle. So Washington decided to take a risk and send his troops across in three separate groups. Uh, Colonel uh, Glover's Marblehead Regiment, these are the 14th Massachusetts uh, Continental Line. These were all boatmen and fishermen. And so they essentially supplied the, the muscle that got the Continental Army across the ice-choked river. Uh, I mentioned that there were no enemy patrols along this bank of the river simply because of the very foul weather, rain, hail, snow, kind of like what we've been having this week here in, uh, in Rhode Island. Well, one of the reasons why it went so badly for the Hessians is it turned very quickly uh, into a, a street by street uh, battle. Uh, and what this meant was the Hessians like all 18th century armies that were used to fighting in linear formations, uh, 
Um, street fighting was not their forte. Uh, the Continental Army had brought artillery pieces. Um, they had gotten 2,400 men across the, uh, the river uh, by early in the morning and made that nine-mile uh, march to, to Trenton. Um, they had a three-pronged attack. So basically, you're being attacked from three different directions. Uh, about seven or 800 uh, New Jersey militia blocked uh, the uh, Aston Pink Creek, which would have been one of the routes of, his, of retreat for the Hessians. So two columns under Nathaniel Green. Uh, we'll have a lot more to say about uh, Nathaniel Green from Coventry, Rhode Island uh, in, uh, in the next session. But under Nathaniel Green, one column, and John Sullivan, the other column. Um, and so the problem was fighting in the streets. It broke up the cohesion of the uh, of the uh, Hessian troops, but also it allowed the Continentals to swing their artillery in. And if you've got buildings here and you're firing grape shot or even solid shot right down an alley or right down a street, if you're standing in formation like these gents here are, you have problems. And so very quickly, the cohesion and discipline uh, broke down as the, uh, as the, the German lines broke apart. Now, Raoul, Colonel Raoul attempted to uh, advance several times. Each time it was broken up by artillery fire. Uh, the Hessian units were separated into the groups, so they lost their command and control um, element. And in fact, here's a portrayal of uh, Colonel Raoul being severely wounded. Uh, he was actually wounded and died. And the end result, I think, of the collapse of the Hessian garrison there at Trenton uh, was it improved morale in the Continental Army. Uh, enlistment soared. Uh, most of those that were re-enlisting or uh, most of those that were uh, due to be let go into their enlistments wound up re-enlisting. So essentially Trenton saved George Washington and the Continental Army. Well, he wasn't done. Um, the Battle of Princeton uh, followed on the 3rd of January. And tactically, it was more of a draw, but strategically and in terms of public relations or what we also call strategic communications, it was a huge victory. Uh, on the 29th of December, uh, the Continentals recrossed the Delaware River and established a defensive position at Trenton. Uh, on the 31st, uh, Washington appealed to his men to reenlist and promised a $10 bounty. A lot of money in those days. Um, most actually stayed. Buoyed by that Trenton victory, uh, most of them re-enlisted or stayed. Uh, so what happened, Cornwallis then uh, marched south out of uh, Princeton, marched south, um, and attacked along Assen Pink Creek, but was unable to, to break the Continental defenses. And so he began retiring north back towards Princeton. Well, in the middle of the night, the Continentals did a uh, an end run. If, if here's the British line of march going back to Princeton, uh, the Continentals taking rags and claws to muffle the, the wheels of gun carriages and wagons essentially came around up. And so come morning, they were on the flank of the, of the British force uh, unexpected. And they attacked uh, Cornwallis's rear guard, which was made up of a couple of, uh, of British regiments, I think the 17th and the 55th. Well, Cornwallis, realizing what was happening, immediately sent reinforcements and checked the attack um, and extricated his two rear guard regiments, and they marched back to Princeton. So it was more or less a draw tactically. But as I said, uh, in terms of uh, what it did for the Continental Army, it was a huge strategic and public relations uh, uh, victory. At this point, Cornwallis, who commanded all the Crown forces in southern New Jersey, uh, abandoned the, the post and consolidated his force up north at New Brunswick. And there's, uh, again, what I call heroic art. Um, what is heroic art? Well, uh, in the in the era before film or photographs, in order to portray what happened in battle, you get these sorts of things. But this is, of course, completely false. <laughs> They're wearing hats that you would not have seen for another 20, 30 years. I think someone pointed that out um, maybe last time with the uh, the Bunker Hill, Con uh, not Bunker Hill, with Concord, Lexington, that the uniforms look more like War of 1812 period. Well, so that's what you have here. Uh, nonetheless, uh, it tried to capture the heroic image uh, for the public 
And that's why uh, they were very, very popular. Okay, back to this. So let's go into a divide and conquer phase. Let, let's cut off New England. Let's destroy the rebel centers of gravity, meaning the Philadelphia, capture the capital, and actually destroy the Continental Army. So this is going to take really two prongs, if you will. The first one is the Hudson Valley Plan, uh, which I'm going to talk about uh, pretty extensively. And th that is uh, General John Burgoyne marching down uh, from Canada uh, with forces uh, coming up from New York to meet at Albany and basically isolate and cut off New England. Well, um, there were really three prongs to this. There was the, the main army under Burgoyne with 10,000 British regulars, uh, 4,000 German troops, and about 650 Canadians, uh, and a lot of Indians. And the idea was to march down the lakes, the Lake Champlain, uh, down to the Hudson and meet at Albany. Then Colonel uh, St. Leisure was coming over from Oswego here on Lake Ontario uh, with a force that uh, was mainly uh, made up of uh, loyalists uh, and Indians. And Lord Howe, or Sir, sorry, Sir William Howe, was to come up from New York with a substantial force and all meet in Albany. Well, that didn't actually happen because General Howe decided on his own to send the main force around, land them here, uh, the head of, uh, head of Elk, uh, which is that top part of the Chesapeake Bay, and march and capture Philadelphia. So you really have here in the uh, summer and autumn of 1777, two separate uncoordinated operations. By the way, there's a, a, a really great scene. If you've ever seen the George Bernard Shaw uh, play The Devil's Disciple, there's a, a really dramatic scene where uh, General Burgoyne is interrogating uh, the main character who's, if you don't know the story, I won't tell you, but he's interrogating this, uh, uh, this supposed patriot trying to find out where the Continental Army is. And an aide comes and delivers him a letter informing him that, that uh, General Howe is not coming up from New York. Rather, he's sailed for Philadelphia. So a really dramatic scene there in, the, in that play. Well, Burgoyne actually defeats a force across here at Hubberton. He captures Fort Ticonderoga. Um, and all is looking good. Well, what about this guy, General... Lieutenant General John Burgoyne, uh, known as Gentleman Johnny, very stylish uh, uh, person. He was from uh, the minor baronetcy, uh, so he was of the uh, aristocracy, but, but not of the nobility. One of the things that is interesting about him and that was different was he admired uh, independent thinking and initiative among the common soldiers. Highly unusual at the time. Uh, the attitude towards the common soldier by senior officers typically was shut up and do what you're told. Um, but Burgoyne was different. Um, he valued what came to be a 20th century Western ideal uh, of the individual soldier being able to take initiative and, and exercise independent thought and leadership. But that was not the case in the 18th century. Uh, he had commanded um, forces uh, and promoted to Brigadier General uh, during the Seven Years' War. And in 1775, he was promoted to Major General and sent to first to Boston and then later sent to Canada uh, to take charge there and relieved uh, Sir Guy Carleton as Commander in Chief Canada. So he developed this divide and conquer uh, concept and, and sold it to the authorities in London. And so he came back across to Canada charged with this mission of executing this uh, Hudson River plan or divide and conquer plan. He had a couple of overarching beliefs that told him this is going to work. One was he expected a great loyalist uh, outpouring. Uh, and to be fair, uh, one would say good assumption because one area, a huge loyalist area, was the whole Hudson River Valley and New York City. Uh, and so it was expected that these thousands of loyalists would turn out in support uh, of the army. Uh, and the second thing is if um, uh, the Continental Army reacted uh, in force, that in between his force and Lord Howe, or 
Sir William Howe's force coming up from New York, they would just simply roll over the Continental Army. Uh, after this whole unfortunate debacle at Saratoga, he, re he returned and actually became commander in chief in Ireland and was quite a playwright. Uh, so uh, he did well after the war. One of the things that surprises a lot of Americans is that there were actually Indian allies on the side of the Patriots. It's always uh, just thought that the allies were supporting the British. And I would say the overwhelming number of tribes actually did support the British, primarily because they saw the British Empire as the only hedge against colonists moving across the mountains into their uh, their territory and in, in what is today Kentucky and Indiana, Illinois, that area. The Iroquois or Iroquois, uh, the Mohawks particularly, they were longtime British allies, traditional British allies. So that was not a surprise. The Oneida Indians actually supported the, uh, the colonists. One of the huge strategic problems and strategic communications problems that the British forces always had was, think about this, reliance on the Indians was just as likely to stir up the loyalists and the neutrals as it was the patriots. Uh, it was sort of the Indians were the common enemy. Uh, and the Indian allies, of course, they had a different concept of warfare. Uh, and that always flowed British commanders. They could never really control their Indian allies. They were very useful as scouts and skirmishers, but um, really militarily, uh, the Indian allies, not only in New York in this campaign, but certainly in the South, um, turned out not to be all that helpful and actually detrimental. Well, I mentioned Barry St. Leger's force that besieged Fort Stanwix, and that's actually an aerial picture um, of the restored fort. And it's a beautiful place. If you're ever in Rome, New York, uh, you have got to go see um, Fort Stanwix. It's a recreated fort, and they actually have reenactors there that show what daily life would have been like in a, an 18th century fort. So uh, they besieged uh, Fort Stanwix, uh, which was held by uh, Patriot militia. Um, and that leads to the battle at Oriskany. Um, the garrison of the fort held out and a uh, reinforcement group under General Herkimer, there you see him, picture of him, um, advanced to try to break the siege. Uh, this is in August of 1777, and that leads to the battle of uh, Oriskany. Well, um, Herkimer was ambushed just a few miles from the fort. He was actually killed in battle. Uh, at a place called Bloody Creek. Uh, Patriots suffered 450 casualties, uh, Crown forces 150. But the problem was when the Crown forces reacted to Herkimer's advance, uh, they lifted the siege. The defenders of Fort Stanwix actually sortied out of the fort and raided the British camp. Well, needless to say, this didn't help the morale of the St. Leisure's force. And then when he heard that um, uh, Benedict Arnold was advancing, towards Fort Stanwix with a thousand man force. At that point, uh, uh, the Colonel decided to lift the siege and head back uh, towards uh, uh, the Great Lakes. So another arm, if you will, of Burgoyne's plan collapses. There, by the way, is a, a broader picture uh, of the Oneidas. Uh, about 40 Oneidas uh, were part of Herkimer's force there. Well, along the way, um, Burgoyne was running out of supplies and sent out a, uh, a recon force, maybe a foraging force, you'd call it, uh, of about 1,200 German troops. This was in uh, the middle of August. A and their mission was to basically forage and bring back supplies uh, under Lieutenant Colonel Friedrich Baum. And they were attacked at Bennington, which is in uh, New York, almost in the Vermont border. Uh, if you're ever up that way, go see the battlefield. It's really very small, uh, and you can walk around it in less than an hour. Uh, uh, Baum was attacked by a very large militia force, primarily New Hampshire and Massachusetts militia, commanded by John Stark, uh, and was pretty well overwhelmed. They constructed a, a small redoubt, defensive position on the high ground. Uh, Stark struck the redoubt in, from three different positions, uh, and essentially overwhelmed the, the German troops. It was a huge 
huge loss. Baum was killed. Uh, his troops surrendered. Um, the crown lost that day, 207 dead and 700 captured to the Patriots, 40 killed in action and 30 wounded. Uh, that was a huge, huge blow to uh, Burgoyne's chances to lose that many troops at one fell swoop. Well, there is um, Horatio Gates, who became the commander of the Northern Department. General Philip Schuyler had initially been the commander of the Northern Department, but he was blamed for that loss of Fort Ticonderoga to Burgoyne early in the campaign. Uh, Horatio Gates had been the uh, second in command, uh, and uh, he was an able administrator. Uh, not much, I'm not going to say a whole lot complimentary about his tactical skills. He should have been better, though. He was, in fact, a retired major in the British Army, sold his commission, and um, emigrated in 1769 to Virginia. So he should have been a better field officer, but he wasn't. Uh, so by 1777, he was the deputy to General Schuyler of the Northern Department. Um, Schuyler was relieved um, early in August, again, blamed for the loss of Fort Ticonderoga. Uh, Gates assumed command. And he's going to take credit for uh, the Saratoga victory, although in reality, the next level down commanders, notably Daniel Morgan and Benedict Arnold, are, were really more responsible for uh, the Saratoga victory. Speaking of Benedict Arnold, uh, he was sent up north as a relief force uh, by George Washington. Uh, when Fort Stanwix's uh, siege was lifted, he uh, joined up with the uh, uh, with Gates's army. Um, but Benedict Arnold's an interesting character. He might have well been the most talented field commander of either side in the war, but personality-wise, he was tremendously flawed. Uh, he was, I think, you'd call him a narcissist. He certainly had a big ego. Um, he did have some legitimate gripes. Uh, despite his successes at uh, Valcor Island uh, and other places, uh, junior officers or officers junior to him were actually promoted ahead of him. Uh, he, um, he had a rather extravagant lifestyle while he was in Philadelphia uh, as part of that occupation uh, or, or uh, while he was in Philadelphia earlier. He married uh, the daughter of a prominent loyalist, and she was, shall we say, a very expensive spouse. So he needed a lot of money. Uh, he had a lot of anger at not giving credit for his achievements. So he's a complex psychological mix of angst and anger and, and ego. And so in a way, it's really not surprising what eventually happened uh, with him turning uh, turncoat, if you will, in 1780. All right. Um, let me check my time here because I don't want to go too far over. Um, Battle of Saratoga really was more a succession of engagements, two primary ones. One, the Battle of Freeman's Farm, 19 September, and the other one, uh, the Bemis Heights uh, battle. So what happened was, uh, as... Um, Burgoyne very slowly advanced down towards Albany. Then all of a sudden he came up against this huge Continental Army force now under General Gates. General Gates. Uh, Burgoyne had basically three options. He could withdraw north back maybe to Fort Ticonderoga or even Canada. Uh, he could attack a numerically superior force. Or he could attempt to cross uh, over the Hudson River to the eastern bank and then make his way that way. Well, he decided to attack, and he attempted to outflank the Continentals uh, at Freeman's Farm. Uh, now, General Gates actually wanted to sit in a defensive position and uh, just await the attack, but Arnold, being the very aggressive, offensive-minded commander that he was, advocated um, to allow uh, a recon in force, a reconnaissance in force, uh, through Freeman's farm to meet the expected attack. And what this resulted in was a general engagement um, over uh, the Freeman's farm area. Well, uh, it was more or less a draw, and both sides essentially had to withdraw to their positions. And that's going to set up, about three weeks later, uh, the Battle of Bemis Heights. And this is the thing that's really going to determine the, uh, the fate of Burgoyne's army. Uh, 
militia poured in to the uh, Patriot side uh, and Burgoyne basically sat there awaiting reinforcement coming up from New York. Uh, remember how was supposed to march up the Hudson and he didn't. He took off and went around Philadelphia. But uh, General Clinton, who was a subordinate commander in New York, actually did march north with about 1,500 troops, got about as far as West Point area, Hudson Highlands, and decided it was too rough a slog. And so he never came up and reinforced the Burgoyne waiting there north of Albany. Um, at this point, um, uh, Burgoyne planned another three-column attack aimed at the continental left to try to break out of this growing encirclement. Uh, and the idea was to attack the continental left and uh, do a holding attack in the front. Uh, that is going to precipitate the Battle of Bemis Heights, 7 October. So Burgoyne sent in the Grenadiers, who were repulsed with a bayonet attack. Uh, the Continental Army actually uh, uh, started advancing against the British force. Um, on the western end of the Continental Line was Daniel Morgan and his Virginia riflemen. These were, these were frontiersmen and actually armed with rifles, not the smoothbore musket. And they did tremendous damage, uh, killed um, uh, a British uh, general officer and did tremendous damage to the attacking force. Uh, and so the, the British advance really didn't get very far. Now, what had happened? Well, Arnold had reported back that uh, his actions basically meant the victory at Freeman's Farm. Uh, well, this didn't sit well with General Gates, who relieved him on the spot and ordered him to stay in his tent. Well, Arnold wasn't going to have this. So he jumped on his horse, as you see there, rode into the action. Uh, Gates sent officers to order him to come back, but Arnold just simply ignored the order. Um, the, the western part or of the uh, Continental Line was beginning to waver under the British attack. Arnold rode there, rallied those men, rode back to the center, rallied those men, um, and led a counterattack. He led a counterattack uh, and forced the Hessians, who were attacking at that point, back into their starting position, which was uh, near the Bremen Redoubt. You can see that in a moment. So I would say Arnold probably was the man most responsible for the victory at Bemis Heights. Uh, unfortunately for him, um, he was wounded again in the same leg that he had been wounded in in the Canadian campaign a uh, year earlier. Uh, and also his horse uh, fell over on him and broke his leg. So uh, he was pretty much out of action. Well, as the battle unfolded and the British uh, reoccupied the Bremen Heights, which was essentially, uh, or the Bremen Redoubt, which was this defended position here. And the Continentals attacked and essentially um, on the right flank of the British force uh, undid them. Um, nightfall ended the battle, but very clearly it was a tactical Continental Army victory. Um, essentially, it, it at the Bremen Redoubt and more broadly the Behemoth's Heights battle, uh, the Continental Army was not broken. Uh, Burgoyne could not break out. Uh, he attempted to cross the river. That failed. And so he was basically uh, stuck in a very bad position. And he had lost a thousand casualties just between those two battles of Freeman's Farm and Bemis Heights. He was now outnumbered about three to one. He was surrounded. There was really no escape. Uh, the forward line had been breached at the, the redoubt there. Um, he attempted to retreat back to Fort Ticonderoga, but he was blocked by the uh, Continental forces. He tried to recross the Hudson. That didn't work. And so the only honorable thing to do at that point is open negotiations for an unconditional surrender. And Burgoyne agreed to what was known as the Treaty of Convention, which meant that not really a surrender, uh, the troops would simply march to Boston, return to the British Isles, and take no more part in uh, North American action. Uh, so based on that, Burgoyne surrendered, if you will, uh, his 5,700 troops. Uh, that was all that was left of him on the 17th of October. Unfortunately for Burgoyne and the surrendered forces, uh, Congress failed to ratify the convention. 
Now, some of the officers were exchanged, but most of the men uh, actually did not march to Boston and head back to Britain. Uh, they were POWs for the end of the war. Uh, being a POW, uh, unless you were on one of the prison hulks, you had many, many opportunities to escape. Uh, this was true of both sides. And quite a few of the German troops actually said enough of this and, uh, and uh, deserted uh, from the prison camps. And so a lot of folks in the New York, Pennsylvania area are descended from these uh, uh, German auxiliary troops that were at Saratoga and managed to escape. Well, let me uh, wrap up here with uh, the uh, Philadelphia campaign. So I mentioned earlier that pretty much on his own initiative, Howe decided to go after Philadelphia uh, rather than support uh, Burgoyne up in the Hudson. So he took 17,000 troops. Uh, it was a 34-day transit, which I've never figured that out. It's not all that far from New York, even around to the Chesapeake coming up. Nonetheless, it took them 34 days. Uh, they landed at Head of Elk, Maryland, which, as I mentioned earlier, is at the, uh, uh, the top of the Chesapeake Bay. The intention, of course, was to take Philadelphia, which was the capital and where the Continental Congress sat. And again, in the, in the 18th century, uh, the theory was that if you capture the enemy's capital, uh, that's it, negotiations end the war. It goes back to the old medieval concept, you capture the enemy's castle or main fortified post and the war's over, you win. Not so in the War of American Independence. Uh, what happened simply was the uh, Continental Congress retired to York, Pennsylvania, went west a few miles and continued operating. Well. Uh, Washington did take advantage of, um, of uh, Howe's action uh, to try to defend Philadelphia, and that's going to lead to a series of battles around the city. And there you can see a map ahead of Elk. Uh, you see it right there, top of Chesapeake Bay. Uh, the British marched across, and that's going to lead to a whole series of battles around Philadelphia. Uh, Brandywine Creek in September, uh, Battle of Paoli which was a nighttime bayonet attack in late September, and then the Battle of Germantown. There you see Germantown in the uh, early October time frame. Uh, there's Paoli right there. Ultimately, uh, Washington retired to a famous place called Valley Forge. And uh, if anybody, I, I know we may have some Philadelphia area folks uh, listening in on this, you've no doubt been to all of these battle sites. But if you really want to do a great battlefield tour, you can do it all in a couple of days and go see Germantown, the Cliveden House. You can go see the field at Paoli. Uh, you could go to the Brandywine. Uh, there's a lot to see down there. You can go to Valley Forge. So I would recommend all four of those places. You can do it a couple of days. So whole series of battles. Uh, eventually, Washington was forced to retire into winter quarters at Valley Forge, and the British forces occupied Philadelphia. What about Brandywine? Uh, big British victory. Washington attempt to halt the, uh, the British advance, uh, and it failed. Howe used a flanking maneuver. Uh, he outflanked Washington. Uh, operational deception is, is where you basically do something to make the enemy think something different or think that you're doing something different. Deception. Uh, Cornwallis actually did this. He marched north as if he was headed for Philadelphia, and then turned around and came south and attacked uh, the, uh, the flank of the Continental uh, Line. So basically, Washington was outflanked. Um, the, uh, Washington believed that the main attack was in his front when all of a sudden Cornwallis appeared on his right flank, um, and that pretty much uh, told the, the tale of the battle here. One of the reasons why Brandywine was not uh, completely shattering for the Continental Army was how delayed his, his attack in the center um, to allow time for the forces to reposition. Um, Washington was able to actually pull his forces in uh, and not repulse, but certainly deal with Cornwallis's attack. If Howe had attacked straight away, um, at this point, perhaps the Continental Army would have collapsed. Uh, nonetheless, it didn't. How delayed too much. Um, 
Nightfall ended the action, but the British captured a great number of the Continental Army cannon or field pieces that you see here. That's a, a three-pounder, uh, three pounder, meaning three pounds is the weight of the shot, uh, three-pounder field piece there. Probably as many as 1,200 Continental Army casualties. So they were pretty, pretty badly beaten up at uh, Brandywine. The Battle of Germantown, uh, the Cliveden House became the central focus. And here's another place you can go see. I'm not sure if you can go inside now, but you certainly can walk around the grounds. It's obviously a, a mansion type place. And that became the centerpiece of the uh, another Continental Army uh, attack to try to defeat British forces in detail. And uh, so they attempted a night attack, um, which um, the problem was it was too complex, uh, uh, too many moving parts, if you will. And ultimately, the, the Germantown attack broke down in a thick fog. And the defense of Cliveden House here uh, really broke apart the Continental Army uh, uh, effort to, to uh, attack and defeat a, a, a British force uh, in detail. So what about the Philadelphia campaign? Well, Congress fled to York, so you re really didn't destroy the political authority. Um, the Conway Cabal, and I'm not going to go into that, but essentially it was a move uh, or an attempt to relieve Washington as commander-in-chief of the Continental Army and replace with uh, General Gates. Uh, that really didn't come to anything. Uh, and in December 1777, um, having failed to... Uh, keep the British out of Philadelphia and failed to drive them out of Pennsylvania. He retired to winter quarters at Valley Forge, which is about 20 miles or so northwest of uh, the city of Philadelphia. And now we're going to introduce this gentleman, Friedrich Wilhelm Ludolf Gerhard Augustine Madrich Estonisch Valvene Kandor von Steuben. And uh, Britta tells me that will be on the final exam, correct? Okay. Uh, you can just call him von Steuben or Baron von Steuben, which he was not. Uh, apparently, his father had invented this noble lineage uh, that just didn't exist. Uh, he claimed to be a general in the Prussian army. He actually, I think, was a captain. But he was a professional soldier and, and an extremely good uh, disciplinarian and trainer. Um, as with a lot of professional soldiers in European armies from France and Poland and other places, uh, von Steuben came over and saw opportunity, if you will, in fighting for the, uh, for the, uh, the Patriots. Uh, he arrived in February of 1778 at Valley Forge, uh, of course, claimed to be a, a general officer of the Prussian army and, and of noble lineage. Uh, he served as Inspector General of the Continental Army and later was George Washington's Chief of Staff. What he did, though, was he brought the Prussian discipline and training to the Continental Army. And he did this by what we today call the train the trainer. In other words, you take a small cadre of non-commissioned officers and junior officers, you train them in the fundamentals of drill and tactics and and movements, uh, whatever, and then they go back to their units and then they train the troops. So the train the trainer concept. Um, by the time the Continental Army emerged from Valley Forge in June of 1778, it was much better trained, much better honed, much better disciplined, and you see the results almost immediately uh, at the Battle of Monmouth Courthouse. Uh, in uh, late June. I'm not going to go into the details of that one, uh, but essentially uh, with the injection of France into the war in February, March time frame of 1778, uh, essentially um, uh, Sir Henry Clinton, who's now the uh, commander in chief in Philadelphia, decides to evacuate Philadelphia, and march back to their main operating base at New York. Uh, George Washington takes advantage of this and attempts to attack this column. And that leads to the um, uh, Battle of Monmouth Courthouse, which is in central New Jersey. Well, there is Sir General, General Sir Henry Clinton. Uh, he relieved Howe in early 1778 in Philadelphia. But he was almost immediately faced with the French problem. 
and he actually received two letters from Lord Germain. Remember, he's the American uh, colonies or American Secretary of State uh, in charge of basically the war. Well, Clinton receives two letters in early March and then one in late March that orders him to send 5,000 troops down to the West Indies. Well, economically, the West Indies with sugar and other commodities were far more valuable to the empire than any of the colonies uh, in North America. And so right away, Clinton is forced to give up 5,000 troops to send down to, to the islands. And this uh, uh, is what really induced him to evacuate Philadelphia uh, and march back to New York. And that's what precipitated the Battle of Monmouth Courthouse. Uh, the British column was spread out for miles and miles and miles and miles and miles. It was complicated by the fact that a lot of the Philadelphia loyalists were fleeing with the army. They were not about to be left high and dry in Philadelphia when the Continental Army came back in and reoccupied. Um, George Washington attempted uh, an attack on the rear uh, under General Charles Lee. Uh, it stalled. Lee attempted to basically retire. Washington rode up and relieved him on the spot, relieved him on the spot for uh, not being aggressive enough, and Washington took direct command. Battle of Monmouth Courthouse. Again, you could call it a tactical draw, but you have to say it was a strategic victory for uh, the Continental Army because once again, even though they didn't defeat the British forces, they proved that they could remain in the field and remain a viable force. So uh, here the British are either winning or not losing all these major engagements, but the real strategic winner uh, ultimately is the Patriot side. Uh, because uh, they prove that they can stay in the field with the with the British Army. So what do we have here by, say, mid to late 1778? Uh, you have the British forces being faced with a, a stalemate in the British colonies. Uh, the Hudson Valley campaign became a disaster. France injected itself militarily into the war because it had been supporting uh, with supplies and money and uniforms and gunpowder, the, uh, the Patriots uh, since the start. But now France becomes openly a combatant uh, in the war. This, to, to use a phrase, scares the bejesus out of London because now there is a direct threat to the West Indies colonies. Uh, and, so, and not only that, but the home islands. And so this is going to mean that uh, now that they're faced with putting down a, a rebellion that they haven't been able to suppress in the North American colonies and, oh, by the way, fight yet another global war against the French and by the next year against the Spanish and by 1780, the Dutch have thrown their hat in the ring as well. So Britain is faced with suppressing the um, rebellion or at least recovering some of the colonies while at the same time fighting the usual 18th century against France and Spain type of war. Big difference now is they don't have any continental allies. They don't have the Russians or the Austrians or the Prussians or these Germanic states that in the past had always allied with Britain against the French and the Spanish. Now they're fighting it alone. So how do you reallocate resources? How do you craft your strategy to at least do something positive, while meanwhile you defend your imperial interests. And so by late 1778, this is the big strategic conundrum facing uh, British authorities. Uh, and how they react is going to be the topic of next week's uh, uh, lecture, the Southern Campaign, or what I call the Southern Gambit, um, which they embark upon by uh, late autumn, early winter of 1778. So strategic reassessment time after uh, Mama Courthouse. Now, let me close with this. I've said all this about strategic reassessment, strategic problems, you know, not understanding the nature of the war, uh, the loyalist strategy failing, and, and all these things. But we all know the real reason why the British lost the War of American Independence. Now, see, if this were live, I'd get a lot of chuckles and whatever, but... <laughs> Um, these guys just, by the way, uh, this is Regiment von Bose, uh, one of those German regiments, these reenactors, um, mostly from the Carolinas and North Florida. Uh, 
And this was, I think, a picture taken at the uh, every year at Camden, South Carolina. Um, there's a big reenactment and a uh, historic field days. And uh, I think that's where this picture was taken. But I'd love to throw it in, get hopefully a good laugh line. So with that, Britta, uh, that's my pitch. And I think uh, I think we got a few minutes for some questions. Same drill as last time. Definitely. Um, we have some already in the chat box. Um, okay. But if anyone thinks of anything else, they can type it in and we'll answer it for you. Um, or I'll make it up, depending on <laughs> the nature of the question. Let's see. Um, someone said, I thought W.M. Howie went back, or Ho, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, how? went back to England how, under um, criticism for the Philadelphia campaign. How did he get knighted? Uh, he had already been knighted. He was knighted uh, due to the New York and New Jersey campaign. Um, so he, uh, by the time he returned uh, to Britain in 1778, uh, he was already Sir William Howe. Now, uh, he did come under a lot of criticism uh, for failing to suppress the rebellion, and, and that gets into a whole area of um, criticism from the opposition, uh, the, from the Whig uh, supporters, the Whig party. You really can't call it a form party, but it was more of an interest. Uh, but yeah, the, the House came under a lot of criticism for failing to... Uh, uh, to actually suppress the rebellion, but ultimately, um, ultimately they made out. They were not uh, very, very few actual generals. Um, British generals did not make out okay afterwards. Uh, even the unfortunate Sir Henry Clinton, who was blamed for the loss of Yorktown, as, since he was a commander in chief, in that whole controversy between him and Cornwallis. Uh, pamphlets flying back and forth, accusations flying back and forth for a couple of years after the war. Ultimately, public opinion decided it was Clinton's um, uh, dereliction or whatever that, that caused Yorktown. But uh, he actually, I believe, was promoted to general and was given a major command. Uh, I, I think the realization was that it was such an intractable, difficult problem uh, that while you might criticize the house for being unable to to end it people realized that it, it, it was going to be very difficult and probably near impossible uh it was such a widespread uh rebellion or reaction against uh the crown uh but again that's a whole new line of you could talk a whole lecture about the the wranglings that went on politically once the house returned uh, but in, in short answer to the question, I know I dribbled on there a little bit, uh, but yeah, he had already been knighted uh, as a result of the uh, uh, 1776 campaign in New York and Phil in, uh, New Jersey. All right. Another question. Um, the delay at um, Brandywine. Might Brandywine? Say, Brandywine. Okay. It was spelled mm -hmm. differently. Brandywine. The delay at Brandywine occurred after the British forces marched over 17 miles in about 10 to 12 hours would it have been realistic to continue straight to the fight uh you know another one of those you probably had to be there to judge how bad it was i mean remember it was it was summertime um in fact the um the year following at monmouth courthouse it was estimated it was 98 degrees uh, and there were about probably about as many casualties from heat stroke as there were from from uh, musketry and bayonet. Um, I, I think the what what goes in the minds of these linear oriented officers of the day, and and not just General Howe, but probably in general, uh, given the chaos of battle and how easy it is for the whole thing to start cohesion wise falling apart i'm actually not surprised that they would delay to try to reform their line to try to get everyone it's called being dressed you know you, you might have heard the term dress right dress kind of thing where you form up because and you may laugh at that 
in our modern sense say, well, why did they do that? They should just hid behind the rocks and trees. And, no, you couldn't do that. In that chaos of a linear battle in the period with all the, uh, the confusion, the noise, um, the, the smoke from the battlefield, if you lost your cohesion, if you lost your linear formation, you were probably going to lose big time because at that point, that's when the cavalry did a lot of damage against you. So to, to have taken a couple of hours to reform the line, to get the whole thing straightened out before you initiate a general assault is really not surprising. And especially considering how far the forces, some, uh, I think you said in the question there, a 17 mile march, uh, think about Think about marching in summer heat, wearing wool uniforms, carrying a 10-pound musket with a bayonet, with all the, gu the, the cartridges, your haversack with your probably couple, three days ration. I mean, think about all that weight you got on you. You don't just say, okay, you guys have marched 17 miles. Now, go, go fight. So it was not surprising to me that how ordered basically a, a two-hour stand down to get everything organized. However, the end result was that gave Washington the time to do the same thing. And I think that explains a lot of, of why the uh, Battle of Brandywine Creek did not go worse for George Washington. All right, another question. Where is that fort south of Fort Mercer on the Jersey side of the Delaware River south of Philly? I do not believe ever seeing that in earlier visits. Uh, Let's see. That might have come from one of our Philadelphia people, I'll bet. Uh, let's see if I can back it up and see what this map says. Uh, Fort Mifflin, Fort Mercer, right there. Well, um, I can't answer that. Uh, I'm not sure what is there, if there is anything there. Uh, can whoever asked the question uh, give us a little bit more information? Randolph Peterson, if you're still on, um, if you want to type into the chat or the question box. Um, he yeah, said, if, you, if you know more about Fort Mercer. Um, he, he said Fort Billings on your map. Oh, Fort Billings. I really don't know anything more about it other than... Um, Whoever made this map, and it's been around for quite a while, um, must have known something about these positions. Now, were there major engagements there? No. Uh, the major engagements around Philadelphia would have been like Germantown, Paoli, Brandywine Creek. Uh, but this, these would have been uh, some sort of fortification constructed by the Continental Army or militia troops. Uh, just in the general defense of Philadelphia, figuring that if you look at this, uh, what if British forces sailed up the Delaware towards Philadelphia? And that's why you built forts like that or fortifications along waterways uh, was to prevent or inhibit um, the enemy from, say, sailing up that waterway and then landing troops near your, your main position. But no, I really don't know anything specifically about the, the history of Fort Billings, which would have been on the New Jersey side. So if anybody does someone know- Someone else commented that yeah. Fort, someone said Fort Billings is no longer there. Yeah, well, I mean, it would have, it would have been some type of uh, redoubt or, or fortification that wouldn't survive. I mean, basically the, what you would do is you would dig out trenches and you would pile the dirt up. You might uh, reinforce it with some type of palisade, uh, but these were not stone forts, if you will. They were quickly thrown up positions, that, and, and then artillery positions could be mounted there. Not something that's going to survive, like, say, Fort Adams here in Newport or uh, uh, some of those coastal forts that were built in the 19th century out of stone. So it, it not surprising that there's nothing there now. And so Randolph Peterson also said Fort Mercer was a defensive battle against a Haitian raid across Cooper's Landing from Philadelphia. Okay, there's Cooper's Ferry right there. So there would have been uh, small skirmishes in the area, uh, obviously. Uh, 
Uh, typically, what would happen is uh, raids would go out or foraging expeditions, meaning going out to collect uh, agricultural goods, forage for the horses, whatever. Uh, and these could be small events, a couple hundred guys maybe. Um, and so there were, there were, in any campaign, there were lots of those type of, uh, of operations that occurred. Um, so if you wanted to, uh, say, knock out these, these fortifications, they would not have been major battles. Uh, but Fort Mercer, uh, th there was action there, as just pointed out. I don't know anything about Fort Billings, and I think Fort Mifflin also had some activity as well. Um, someone posted a link to a Wikipedia page about Fort Billings in the chat mm -hmm. if anyone wants to click okay. on that. Yeah, I, I just have to plead ignorance on that. Uh, I don't know that much, if anything, about what actually happened there. But it's easy enough to find out. Mm -hmm. So another question, um, at this point in the war, what was the public opinion about, what was the public opinion about it in England? Uh, increasingly frustrating. Um, part of the problem, and I'll go into a little bit of this next week, was uh, the American privateers or privateers were singularly successful at attacking British trade. Uh, there's a really good book by a fellow by the name of Bowler, came out in the mid-70s, and he looked at the logistical problem uh, of supplying the British Army essentially from England and Ireland. And um, he estimates that something like 3,000 uh, British merchantmen of some size could be a coastal craft all the way up to a large ship. Uh, were actually captured by the Continental Navy or the French Navy or the privateers. That's a huge blow to your trade. And what you see happening uh, in Britain is a couple of things. First off, the merchant interests are beginning to put a lot of pressure on Parliament, on the government to end this thing somehow. Negotiating and beat them, restore allegiance, whatever you have to do, because they were losing money. The second thing that was more broadly public opinion, um, in 1778-79, Parliament had to impose um, a form of uh, conscription or the draft. Now, this flies right in the face of the, of the British thinking on conscription. Um, it, was, it was considered a tool of an overarching or overreaching monarchy. Uh, and this really gets back to the uh, 17th century in the in English Revolution, which ultimately established the sovereignty of Parliament, um, giving Parliament overall control of the military because there was this anti-standing army uh, ideology that had grown up in Britain that said, hey, it's fine to have militia uh, where they're locally controlled. Uh, officers are all our local landowners. Uh, our, our militia are our local tenants and laborers and population. But we don't want to give the crown a large standing army that they can impose their will. And so there was a long standing anti standing army uh, idea uh, in the British psyche. And so when you start conscripting people to send them over to fight what a lot of people in Britain saw as our American cousins, there was a lot of resistance. There, there were a lot of riots. Um, by 1780 or so, uh, now this was religiously based, but the Gordon riots, uh, particularly in London, uh, there was a lot of public hate and discontent. But I think the bigger thing was as the, uh, say, the merchant class that had largely supported restoring allegiance to the colonies, as they began to take economic losses, and as this thing drove on and on, think the Vietnam thing, same kind of dynamic. A uh, huge part of the population supports it initially. But as the body bags, so to speak, start coming home, as the casualties mount, as it gets more expensive, and particularly after now we're fighting the French and the Spanish and the Dutch, what you see is a, an erosion of public support. Uh, so after Yorktown in the uh, parliamentary elections of uh, early 1782, the Lord North's government loses its majority, and the Whig uh, government comes in and right away they start negotiations with the French and the Spanish and the Dutch and the Americans to end the thing. Uh, 
So again, I dribbled on and on and on, but the, the point being a lot of support initially, um, but that degraded over time uh, as it became much more protracted and the inability of British military forces to crush the rebellion. Another question, mm -hmm. see. Where did General Washington and troops stay in the days leading up to the attack on Trenton in December, 1776? You mentioned Valley Forge in the context of winter 77 to 78. Yeah, they were just, they were encamped across the river in that area there. There's Trenton, there's Princeton. Um, so in this area here on the Pennsylvania side, just across the Delaware River. The uh, camp at Valley Forge uh, was not established until December of 1777. Once all these battles and skirmishes around Philadelphia, the British occupied Philadelphia in late September. Uh, once it was pretty obvious that, that the Continental Army was not going to drive the British out or keep Philadelphia, uh, they established the camp or the, the winter um, quarters at Valley Forge. Uh, and the idea was that you were close enough so that you could keep an eye on the British, but not so close that if they decided to march out in a winter campaign, it'd be pretty obvious pretty quick. So uh, in answer to the initial question, it was in this area here on the Delaware River side or Pennsylvania side of the Delaware River um, was where they were by December of 76. Someone asked, do you know if there's anything representing that area today? Uh, yeah, um, it's called Washington's Crossing State Park. And it's, uh, it's an interesting place. I was there in the summer of 1778, I think, 1978. <laughs> as old as I feel now, it might have been the summer of 1778. Um, it's pretty, as I recall, pretty mountainous and pretty rugged. Uh, I remember going up a mountain and down the mountain and across the creek. Uh, but there is a state, I believe it's a Pennsylvania state park in that area of where the Continentals would have uh, uh, encamped. Uh, but it's been a long time since I was there. If, if some folks want to go and report back, do a recon patrol, that would be great. There, They do. And uh, I don't know when it was last done, uh, but pretty much every year there's a reenactment of the crossing of the Delaware. Now, they don't do it probably in wintertime, um, but there usually is a, a reenactment of the crossing of the Delaware uh, in this in this area here. Probably not the same location as they actually came across, um, but there is a, a reenactment that's done or has been done in the past. And then um, a follow up to that same question. Mm -hmm. Were they there a long time or was it just a staging encampment? Well, once they were pushed back out of New Jersey uh, and they crossed in here in December. So they were only there for about three weeks or so before they came back across, um, to, did the Trenton battle, then recrossed the Delaware. And then on the 29th, they came back across and retook Trenton, and that's what precipitated the uh, the Princeton uh, campaign. Now, um, where did they go then? They recrossed the river. I don't think they stayed here. Um, some recrossed the river, but at this point, I think the main army moved north, and I don't, I can't move the map, but they eventually moved up north as Cornwallis withdrew his forces back towards the city. Um, the bulk of the Continental Army went up and they stayed most of the rest of the war up in this region here, the northwest, uh, basically around Morristown, Morristown, New Jersey, um, with the same idea as you did with the Valley Forge. Uh, once the British forces had retired from Philadelphia, uh, there's Monmouth Courthouse, returned to New York, then the bulk of the Continental Army moved up to Morristown. Again, a good distance. So if the British attempted any attack, you have plenty of warning, uh, but you could sort of keep a, a wary eye on them. Um, now, what did they do after immediately after Trenton, Princeton? And we'd have to look that up. Um, 
but I, I'm pretty sure that they would have stayed more or less in this area. Because remember now, by the, by the summer of 1777, they were very clearly concentrated in this area here. Um, two people mentioned that the reenactment um, is done on Christmas Day. Oh, it is. Okay. So Someone said they've been weather be damned. Years. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I've seen photographs. I've never uh, seen it live, but I've seen photographs of it, and uh, it's pretty spectacular. All right. It looks like there aren't any more questions. If anyone has anything um, that they thought of last minute, you can type it out. Oh, someone. One last question. Um, someone said there is a New Jersey State Park on the Delaware at Washington Crossing, reenact mm -hmm. reenactments of the crossing is held on Christmas Day every year. Okay, good. So um, bottom line here is everybody's tasked to go see all these things <laughs> and report back. Britta is taking notes and reports. There's there's a lot to see. Uh, and obviously now with the, the plague, oops, the plague going on, uh, there are some fantastic places to go see and get a sense of the history of, of um, what went on, uh, whether it's a state park or a national park. Uh, uh, they're just literally hundreds all over. So uh, I most highly encourage you to go out and actually see the places. In the military sense, we call it a staff ride. Uh, for example, um, students from uh, the Army War College, which is in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, uh, they always are going staff rides to say Civil War battlefields in Virginia, Maryland, Pennsylvania. Uh, I remember when I was at West Point, um, it a, was a one month uh, course in teaching military history that was sponsored by the history department at West Point. And we took a staff ride up to Saratoga, up to Fort Ticonderoga uh, and around a couple others. And the idea is to get a sense of things like the terrain uh, that, that commanders have to deal with. I mean, something as simple as a little high rise. You're going to see that if you know anything about um, the, uh, the Battle of Cowpens, which I'll talk a little bit about next week. One of the reasons why uh, Bannister Tarleton launched this attack before he had organized his forces was he didn't realize because of a little slight ridge that there were significant continental forces, particularly dragoon or cavalry, on the other side. So to go and actually see these places, you begin to understand a lot more of why certain decisions were made or when they were made or how they were made just by looking at the, the terrain and the layout. Uh, so uh, I, I highly encourage battlefield tours for anybody who's interested in, uh, in the history of these great events. Um, going off of that, two people commented that um, uh -huh. There's a reenactment of the Battle of Trenton between Christmas and New Year's called Patriots Week in Trenton. Mm -hmm. um, there's also an annual reenactment of Washington's encampment at Valley Forge over the right. weekend of Washington's birthday. It may not be scheduled this year due to COVID. Sure. Uh, in early 1777, late 76, um, I was there at the reenactment of Trenton. Uh, portraying a uh, a kilted Highlander, and let me tell you, crouching down because w when you're doing linear battle, uh, typically uh, the first rank crouches down to fire, and the second or third rank are behind them. Crouching down in the snow on bare knees, which is what you have when you're wearing a kilt, was very interesting. In the middle of Princeton, New Jersey, crouch down in the snow or down on your knees to fire in the snow. And everybody came back with bruised red knees that was wearing the kilt. Just a little side story there. But yeah, I, battle reenactments are, are tremendous uh, ways to see a recreation of, of what actually happened. Um, I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend Civil War battles so much. They, well, I won't go into there. Typically, though, what you'll find that the reenactors that do War of 1812 or American Revolution period, they tend to be very serious uh, about doing it right or portraying the way it really looked. Um, so I highly recommend uh, going to any of these uh, events. And, and then you also get a good sense of the dynamics of it doesn't take long for the whole battlefield to be completely covered in this black powder smoke and haze. And then you begin to see why things like 
uh, drum beatings and music uh, to per, uh, distribute commands or to, to get commands out to the troops and why that linear cohesion um, was so important. Because again, once you start drifting apart and lose your cohesion, um, that's, when, that's when casualties occur. Uh, you lose that cohesion in that linear battle, uh, you're almost always going to lose. And then someone asked, um, were you wearing your kilt in the traditional manner? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Story time. And if I'm politically incorrect here, I apologize. Years and years ago, uh, the band of one of the Scottish Highland regiments might have been the Black Watch because they always make tours around the world and do concerts. Well, I heard this from somebody who witnessed it. Uh, after the concert, this was in Raleigh, uh, several of the, of the pipers and drummers still kilted out, went to a local bar. Some drunk came up to one of these guys, this hugely tall Scottish Highlander, and asked him, well, what do you guys wear under those skirts? And the story goes, the, the Scot looked down at the guy and said, why don't you run your hand up and find out? <laughs> I won't say anything further. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that looks like that was the last question. I um, think that's got to be the last one. <laughs> good way to wrap up. <laughs> yeah. So I look forward to seeing everybody next Wednesday. And we'll wrap it up with the, uh, the Southern Campaign and a little bit on the Naval War. Yep. If anyone's not already registered for that, um, you can find the registration link on our email or you can email me and I'll register you for, I'll register you myself. I'm just going to type my email into the chat before I log off. Okay. Yeah, so All right. Well, we, I think we've solved our technical problems. So good. <laughs> Yeah. And apologies to everybody about the last time. I, I did figure out what was wrong with the computer, and it's now fixed. All right. Well, thanks for oh. um, being here tonight, Stan, and thanks for everyone to everyone that came to to watch. Um, hopefully, we see everyone next Wednesday. Okay. Thank you all, and uh, everybody enjoy the snowstorm. Bye. All righty. All right. We'll see you later. Bye. Have a good night. Right. Take care. You as well.